Hey everybody, I'm Robert. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the Nurburgring. I'm excited today to get to share with you guys the breakdown video and the actual diagnosis of the M3 motor that we blew up, the M3 sitting here. I'm next to the GT2. The reason I'm next to the GT2 is that we found it quite funny that in yesterday's video where we were talking about maintenance of the fleet and just general uh, problems that we had that we completely forgot that last week we've had to put a new motor or not a new motor gosh here we go a new transmission in the gt2 after about 44,000 kilometers so yeah george and i had a good laugh that we were talking about the maintenance of polos and m4s and all these things and i said yeah and the porsche has been reliable except the transmission we had to put last week so that was definitely a, a surprise to us we weren't expecting that but we did it but why don't we go ahead jump in we're going to go look at the m3 motor uh, george is tearing it down now actually we're going to jump in and see exactly what happened to it why did we have to take it out and why do we have to replace it? Let's jump in, check it out. Oh, look at that. Super easy. All right, so here's a, a quick little view of the valve train, which I think is actually pretty cool. You know, I'm a old school push rod V8 kind of guy. So, you know, seeing all this overhead shit is, uh, you know, different, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's certainly something. It's between, between blowing up the Yaris and, and uh, you know, this, I, get, I, get my, I, get, I guess I get my lessons, huh? The eye opener. Yep. And it, I was an eye opener for a lot of people who think, oh, can't be that hard to strip an engine down. No, this is actually quite complex, isn't it? You get it open and you have to start thinking about, okay, what comes out next? So think about this. When the M4 uh, broke the exhaust, it was the exhaust camshaft, correct? Yeah, the exhaust camshaft, correct. So we had a crack in the exhaust camshaft. In fact, where's that at? I'll go grab it. It's upstairs on the BMW shelf in a long cylinder box. I'll go look for it. but. When, when that cracked, that means that we took it to the BMW dealer, they did the job for us. They had to break all of this down, just like George has here. And they had to get in here to get to the exhaust camshaft. It's actually a pretty detailed job, huh? Oh yeah. To be honest with you, it's not a job I'd wanna have to do. I'll be right back with the M4 camshaft. So this right here, if you get in here, Tom, you can see that this cracked on this lobe. So this is the exhaust, exhaust camshaft and just from thousands and thousands of kilometers of running, it just ultimately cracked. There are was hollow, it, hollow shaft on these as well, which I'm not a fan of. Look at that. Was it just this one lobe that cracked? Yeah. Yeah. So the crack was causing a sound that sounded like a, a lifter that's failed. When you get a hydraulic lifter, you get that. So this is the, this is the exhaust camshaft, but I'm going to hold it up here on the intake for you so you can see about, about where it sits. Okay. So, um, there, it's not going to be the exact same layout, but it's going to be, it's going to be right there, just down here. Okay. So you can see that it sits right in here. It basically rotates and this is what opens and closes ultimately the exhaust valve. And on this camshaft, the intake valves, the intake valves are what layer, what lets air into the motor. The exhaust valves are what lets the exhaust out of the motor. And that's basically how that works. And an interesting thing about the old V8 motors that I was mentioning earlier is that push rod motors don't allow for variable valve timing. That's where you basically alter the position of the lobes on the camshaft to let air intake in sooner, exhaust out later, maybe let a little bit of overlap between the two. You have to create a camshaft for a V8 motor so that it is exactly what you want. I love a big camshaft, really lumpy idle, loses a little bit of power and torque on the low end but gets you a lot of power and torque on the top end. So top end power, I should say more top end power and a really lumpy idle are two great things about a big, strong American V8. But with a variable timing system, you can actually uh, basically make your uh, overlap less in the mid range, get more torque. You can get more on the top end and you can actually get higher horsepower on the top end and more torque in the mid range. And that's the beauty of this overhead cam situation with variable valve timing. It's obviously the better way to go, the smarter way to go for power creation, torque creation, as well as fuel economy. Did I get that, George? Yeah. Cool. 
And so Misha and Pancake want to see the inside of oh, a motor. Fuck. <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you guys want to do dueling yeah, videos cool, here? Cool. Uh, yeah, we could. Now we know I Misha's mean, video is coming out before this hello. one, right? <laughs> she she wait, wait. Her away she just had a bath on yeah, she's definitely going to get oily. We've got, we've definitely got a mess going Let on here. Let me say hello first. All right, guys, we're going to go for a little intermission playing with the dog. <laughs> Another real big benefit to the overhead cam situation when I was talking earlier about the difference between a push rod motor and an overhead cam motor is that just to get the cylinder head off, you actually have to take the entire timing chain and everything apart, which makes things a much larger pain in the butt. Yes basically so there was a tensioner that goes in here mm -hmm. that's down here in the drain pan that tensioner comes out loosens this chain and the hope is that we can get this guide out of here and again hopefully remove the chain um, without more disassembly we'll see s55 is still new to me bmw is still new to me so we don't have access to technical documents like most people would who are BMW specialists. And Tom's using the new iPhone 13 Pro Max double throwdown. It's <laughs> <laughs> like an advertisement, didn't it? But Tom's using the phone for um, the video recording, so that's our YouTube technical book right there, right? So we can't use that. Might just be a case that we just yeet this off, you know? I mean, I'm ready to get the grinder out, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to go back together, which is lucky. Someone on the internet is laughing because there's like a button right here that you push. That yeah, someone, there's a BMW technician <laughs> watching right now. He's done thousands of these. He's now laughing like <laughs> amateurs. But honestly, there's got to be something else. That can't get that guy out, so. David Pitar, how are you doing, man? Not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. Where were you this weekend, racing? Yes, sunny past the It's not so sunny now. How'd you do? Stay close to me because I only have one mic here. Good to see you. And you, and you. Good, good. I'll hold this here so that you, we can hear each other. Yeah, so. What's happened here then? Well, we have a problem, David. The last person to drive the M3. Oh, no. Did it break when you were driving or just when we started it? No, it was when we started uh, it. When we started it, wasn't it? It was, uh, it was sat there smoking. And yeah. I don't think it got run that day. Okay. No, it didn't. What oh, happened? I know the gun is. Well, David Pitard drove the car. <laughs> to its limits, like yeah. always. And you were also the last person to drive the GT2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Before the transmission broke. Yeah, no. Well, George and I had this discussion that <laughs> Tim's put all the mileage on, and then I jumped in, and then... He set you up for failure. Yeah, he set me up, exactly, yeah. basically. No, but guys, those of you who don't know, David, this is David Petard. He was actually quite a cool accomplishment just a couple of weeks ago on the Nürburgring, huh? Yes, that yeah, was so. a nice way to finish the Nürburgring season, uh, setting a new race lap record yes. um, of a 7.53.2, uh, which is a combination of the Grand Prix circuit and the... Uh, Nodge Life, and I think that translates to around a 6.10, 6.15 bridge to gantry lap time, yeah, basically. Not too bad, huh? Fairly, fairly, uh, fairly, um, no, full lap time, I want to say. Yeah, full lap time. So it's, uh, yeah, fairly, you're cracking on at that speed. You're, you're moving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so, for, so, so for those that don't know, in, in, in like David just mentioned, when you're racing VLN, which is the, obviously the top end race series that happens on the Nordsch Life, huh? in a GT3 car, so he's, he's running in a, a BMW M6 GT3, which has now been retired, right? Because you're going to go to the M4. Yeah, yeah, we um, went out um, yeah, on, on, on a bit of a glory set yeah, that's that cool. record, which is nice. Yeah. Good so, send off for the car. So what that means is that this lap record is for all GT3 cars, really any race car that's ever been on the Nürburgring and the Nordschleife. In, in a race. Yeah. In a race. Um, setting a lap time in this regard during a race, and that, that's pretty positive. Was that during the race or in qualifying? No, it was in, in the race. It's pretty cool, huh? So it, it's, it's a, a full uh, official lap record because lap records are only set in races, in races as opposed to qualifying lap records. My teammate has a qualifying lap record as well, which is cool. Uh, and yeah, it was lap two of the race, which is pretty much the only clear lap you get in the whole four hour races that we were doing. Um, and uh, even that was with one bit of traffic anyway, so there's always room for improvement. That's pretty cool. So you're but saying yeah, full tanks as well. So so when you guys are looking at it and you're saying that's a 752? 53. 753.2. Um, full lap of the Nürburgring, Nordschleife and GP track combined, which equates to a very low six minute BTG. Yep. Very low six minute BTG. And we're over here in the TF guys, you know, doing Pushing for seven minutes, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're cracking on at that Sub pace. seven, sub yeah, seven. In a sub go seven. Go for a sub six, huh? Yeah, I know. I mean, that's, well, uh, 
and in terms of a GT3 car, that would really be pushing it. But <laughs> we did have the discussion that we were thinking, right, on the last time that the M6 ever runs, let's just take all the restrictors out. Let's see what it'll do. Let's just completely just not follow the regulations, go out for one I lap, mean, see what there's, happens. There's another interesting just to point. see the potential of the car. Another very interesting point. We're tearing down the, the, the M3 motor because we're looking at, we want to find out what broke in it, mm -hmm. right? Oh, look at this. George got the... Uh, the, the, everything torn down. He's ready to go. I don't know what's happening right now. You figured it out? I don't know. I just pulled things off and it worked. So, <laughs> mechanic. <laughs> um, anyway, going back to it, the M3 right here is running on the full power mid to high fives, horse, 500 horsepower. Mm -hmm. As of recent, I was explaining that we're, I've actually dropped down into the uh, low fives just to save the transmission because it was kind of, you know, limping along. Mm -hmm. What kind of power are you running in the GT3, the M6 GT3? What kind of power are you running? Um, so it runs the 4.8 uh, twin turbo V8 engine. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the way GT3 racing works is it's called balance of performance. So they'll add restrictors to the car. They'll add weight to the car. They'll add ride height down restrictions, etc. To slow the cars down, essentially. And balance how an M a massive M6 can race a Lamborghini um, a Huracan GT3 car right. as well. So, um, yeah, we, we run engine restrictors as a result of it, and uh, we run especially um, well, small restrictors for the Nord Life because of how dangerous and tricky the circuit is versus a wide open Grand Prix GT3, circuit. Okay. So we're running between 450 and 500 horsepower when it comes to um, the actual output of the engine and obviously depending on how the balance of performance is then varied. And this is a very interesting point. So he goes, depending on the BOP, maybe 450 horsepower, maybe 500 horsepower. And this may not be your apartment, but do you remember how long you get to run a motor before it gets rebuilt? Uh, they run a whole season. A whole season. So that's the, so for example, the Nordschleife, there is um, four, no, there's eight four hour races, one six hour race, and then a 24 hour race as well. Okay. So you're up to about 30,000 kilometers. 30,000 kilometers. And that's when they rebuild the motor. Mm -hmm. And that's about, where we are, yeah. 35,000 kilometers, okay. and we're rebuilding the motor. But a big difference is between the two is we're running a much smaller motor, mm -hmm. and we're not running restrictors, so we're at a, a much higher percentage of the capacity of this motor. Mm -hmm. If we ran the restrictors that you're running, if you want to put cylinder load and everything like that as a comparison, we're, we would probably need to be down in the horsepower yeah. to be in the same regard. So, so very interesting that you guys are getting a full season out of it. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what um, the GT3 regs are pretty much built around. Yeah, the the awesome. running cost of the car, the, those major uh, overhauls and upgrades are, are meant to be done um, for, for, for an entire season. For an entire that's season, really cool. Correct, yeah. So 30,000 kilometers roughly Ish. out of that motor, 35, 36,000 here. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually doing too terrible. <laughs> yeah, BMW wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, raise their eyebrows too much. Uh, yeah, that. That, make, that makes me happy to hear. <laughs> I know that when I was looking at the Huracan and then some of the Porsche stuff, they do it by hours. Mm -hmm. you know, they were doing a lot, a lot by hours of runtime, and it wasn't as generous as this. It definitely, okay. it definitely wasn't as generous as you know, getting a whole season out of it. Mm. You know, so that, that's definitely very interesting. But guys, David Petard, he drives taxi for us. He's uh, yes, he's come along. Current Nurburgring race lap record holder. Yeah, lap um, record holder, driver, lap record holding car. Yeah. But the combo yeah. doesn't get much better. Yeah. Way to go, huh? Cool. Come Thanks, along. man. <laughs> That's close to where our problem is, George. That head bolt. It is. It's stuck between the number four and the number five cylinder. Any water squirt out? Not yet. Pushy tight. Oh, that was disappointing. All right, so we've just about got all the bolts loose. We had to move some things out of the way so we could get the last couple head bolts. We've got one more bolt here, and then we've got two sensors to remove. And once we have those two sensors out of the way and the last bolt removed, we're going to try and yank the head off. Intake cam, exhaust cam. We've got all of our springs, rockers, timing chain. So we've got everything off of the camshaft, all the gears off. And now, you can see if you look in here, Tom, that we have the chain clear so that when we lift the head off, the chain will stay down with the block and we'll be able to lift the head away. 
And the last bolt that we have to get is right up here. Right behind that plate. And once that's out, we should be able to take the head off. So we're getting close. I can tell you that this is not how we would work on a motor that was in a car. No, this is... <laughs> this is hillbilly this is, redneck. This is literally... Done. This is learning <laughs> while we go in because... We don't care. We don't care because this engine is <laughs> fucked anyway, so... Okay. Here we go. Uh-oh. One of your bolts isn't all the way out. It's not, is it? Hmm? That sucks. Because mine were all good. All the ones I did. Let's <laughs> go. This end of the pan. Come on over here to number five, Tom. Oh, look how shiny five is. Five's looking good. It got a steam cleaning. So five is all shiny because the coolant was obviously burning, which when water burns, it's steam. So it steams the piston, it gives it nice and, and nice clean, but what exactly failed? We don't we know yet, to, we're gonna get there. We need to check. So. so what we can do, do you wanna clean the cylinder out with that? All right, so we've got the, the head off the motor, head off the block, and it's the number five cylinder here. Tom, why don't you jump in and you can see that. We started looking at it to see if it was head gasket. Might be the most logical place to start. Mm. Then we started to look around and see if any of the water jackets had cracked in and were maybe leaking water into the cylinder head. One interesting thing is that as you open each of the uh, valves by rotating the camshaft, you don't see any clean areas or anything that looked like water had flown through. So that tells us it probably doesn't have anything to do with the mm -hmm. head itself. Yep. Um, come on down here, Tom. We can look at this. We looked at the head gasket and I'd say there's nothing really evident on the head gasket. A couple of little For, areas that look suspect, but then they, they look suspect on two cylinders. A little bit of rust down here was one yeah, of the things exactly. George saw. So this is a head gasket. This is a multi-layered head gasket. So it's basically multiple layers together that compress together to create a seal, right? And then this is our cylinder. So this is really fun. We haven't even cleaned the cylinder. We didn't clean the piston top. Go ahead and pull out a little bit so you can see <laughs> the differences between the healthy cylinders and the cylinder that was clearly getting water in it somewhere. So we really had to look around. These are water jackets here. So basically cooling water is flowing from the water pump through the cylinder head and then returning back through the radiator and back into the motor ultimately through the cylinder head, through the cylinder block. And coolant runs through each of these little jackets that you see. And on motors, it's a very common area for you to get a crack. One, because the block is weaker there, you have temperature differences, there's a lot of reasons why you can get a crack there. And it's hard to see, but there's a hairline crack that starts here and runs down this way. You can Actually, with, with your shadow, the thing you can there, see it perfect, huh? Yeah, so you can see that hairline crack, and that doesn't run exactly with the pattern that the rings are creating on the cylinder wall. There's a hairline crack that runs from there down to there. And that's where our problem is. So we've cracked the block on the number at the number five cylinder in one of the water jackets. And that's it. So simple as that. If you need your uh, any head work done on your S55, we're the guys now. <laughs> and <we're> basically <laughs> one stop shop for F80 M3 now. So. so come on down, we'll diagnose your uh, your problems. You've got to buy a new motor first. Yeah. <laughs> But there it is, guys. Cylinder, uh, the cylinder head was good. Head gasket was good. But we have a cracked block. I'll circle this. Um, Tom, why don't you come back over here? You got the light, I think. Or do I got the light? So this is our crack right here. Cracking. So, so guys, hope you learned something. <laughs> we we did. We're not we're not going to be working on a live s55 really probably anything with variable valve time it's, it's something honestly when the uh m4 had the problems george said let's just give it to the dealer we don't want to mess with this you need so many specialty tools it's the problem is you end up 
I know once you have the tools, you can obviously do the job more than once, but in two years I've been here, we've had one valve train issue with a BMW. Right. And for us to miss, and for us to go and spend two grand on special tools, no. because obviously we don't want some cheap crap from eBay that's gonna bend for the time in an engine up. It's, it doesn't make sense in some cases, so. Yeah, so jobs like these we'll send out. Obviously we're happy to tear something apart, but what we'll do is we're just gonna you know, take the parts off the motor that we want to keep, stuff that, that's going to be beneficial to us as a spare in the future, and then the rest of it's going to ultimately go to junk. We'll see. Maybe I can, if, if, if we feel like we want to hunk a metal lane around, maybe we'll make a cool table out of it or something like that, but I'm not so sure I want to deal with that. I enjoy keeping camshafts and maybe rockers from a blown Yaris, but I don't know Speaking if I Speaking of like rockers, we could actually do a new batch of key rings with the M4 rockers. We, we could, couldn't we? Because that was the M4 cracked cam so we have m4 uh, rockers because we replace the rockers and we also got a couple rockers here let's see what we can do if you guys want some more keychains let us know that'll be that'll be up to you guys to decide cool guys not a whole lot more to say Thirty-five thousand kilometers we with about 500 i would say 560 horsepower on average towards the end of its life toned it down to closer to 500 we blew um, or we, we put a crack in the number five cylinder wall through a water jacket. Um, that's why we actually have a diagnosis video where the spark plug came out and coolant was shooting out of the number five. And, and it's, it's tricky when you're doing that because it can be many things and you think, am I pulling an entire motor out, you know, for whatever. But the reality is if it was just a car you were daily driving, you might say, well, I'll throw a new head gasket on. I'll take it apart and see, but it, we're running it as a taxi. The minute we saw this, we knew motors coming out. We're not going to. I mean, this with was it. an early catch as well. Yeah, very early catch. This, 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 this as soon as we saw smoke, we pulled it. Yep. This could have so. been. They, once we noticed that there was smoke and a coolant smell, the car didn't make it on track. So yeah, it didn't even know, go on track. Yeah, I mean, matter. it would have been on track with a minor issue, but right. it wasn't detectable. Probably would have ran a couple laps like this. <laughs> I mean, the worst case scenario: the crack opens up, lets in a hell of a lot of coolant, yep. and it hydrolocks, yeah. throws a piston yep. through the. Uh, for us abroad through the block. Yeah, and then you've got oil on the track. You've got you've got a mess. You got a mess. That is. You got a big mess. So guys, hope hope you learned something. Like I said earlier, we definitely did. Um, it was it was it was actually fun tearing this motor apart and getting to see how BMW built this motor. Um, and it's good because we're gonna. This is an engine we're gonna continue to run for at least the next three yeah, to four years. Absolutely. Easily. Absolutely. So. I said the M4 VLN has this motor. The M2 Comp, which a lot of you guys don't even know that I have, has this motor. The uh, M4 rental car has this motor. Taxi. This taxi has this motor. So that's four cars that we're running right now with this motor. And um, then obviously we've had the couple blown up in this and there might be something else that runs a motor. I can't even think of N55 that. is similar. Yeah, similar motor, so that's the, the M2. M2. Car, so. so we're gonna be running this motor for a while. So it's at least good to know about it. Even if we're not gonna be working on it when the dealer tells us, yeah, we need to do this. We're like, oh yeah, that's screwed, have fun. So guys, we'll catch you later. Thanks for everything. Hope you enjoyed it. Peace.